big points for me are first that humans have always been on the move. We've always been a migratory species. That's one of the hallmarks of our humanity. And that we've always been diverse and learning and adaptable and flexible. And that's how we spread out to all different parts of the habitable world. And finally, on Wednesday, we'll learn that the idea that humans come in these chunks of, of groups that we call races is a, an incorrect way to view humanity. It just simply does not work as a biological division of our species. So those will be the three big lessons that I'd like to keep in mind for the, the as we look into some of these, these excruciatingly uh, detailed accounts, I always like to have my, my big picture stuff in mind. Now, well, when it comes to human evolution and this study of ancient, ancient stuff, uh, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things that are complicated and there's a lot of debates and I want to say from the outset that these debates are often very heated, but they're within the field of evolution. There's no one that's, they're within the general framework or accepted theory of evolution. It's simply about the details of which, what happened when. Now, a lot of these debates, there's a lot of discussion about teeth and dental formulas and what you might learn from the creature's teeth and you'll be reading about jaws and teeth all the time. Why are we always talking about teeth? Yeah. The part of the skeleton that preserves the best over time. It would be wonderful to be talking about all kinds of other parts of the skeleton, but in many cases, those parts are simply not there. And so as we know from contemporary uh, disasters that we have, the teeth and the dental records are often what we use to identify people. And it speaks to this general idea that the fossil record is extremely fragmentary. The, when you're a, when you're a creature who is alive, one of your biggest goals in being alive is not to become a fossil. You know, you don't want to die and be fossilized. If that happens to you, that's not good. So you're trying to not become a fossil. And if you do die, it's often the case that scavengers and other creatures are going to get your bones and, you know, take all the stuff away. So it seems like there are, there are certain regions that are more productive than others. One of those regions that we know a lot about, or I mean is, has been the most productive, is the Great Rift Valley in East Africa. And most of the good stuff of human evolution happens in Africa. But we know a lot more about what happens in East Africa simply because that's the region that gives us fossils. So we've come to know that there were probably other things going on in West Africa and Southern Africa and Northern Africa, but they simply have not been fossil producing regions. And the other problem is that there are time gaps. Even in a productive region, you might be missing 100,000 years or a million years, and you just don't know hardly anything about what happens during that time period. So even if you find something, of course, well, Ariana, what do you have to do when you find something? We're interested in this big word here, taf taphonomy. What is that?
still thinking about being able to go back home and to watch the movie. Yeah, the study of what happens to organic remains after death. And trying to figure out if what happens to them after death is a result of something that they might have done or is something that happens as a natural process. There's a huge debate. I don't know if you, uh, there, if any of you saw the news, it been big news for the last and about three or four years ago. No, maybe five. A uh, homo and a lady find in South Africa and in the caves and this wonderful, it gets described a little bit later on in the textbook, uh, wonderful find, really great preservation of bones there. And the people who discovered these are arguing that they were deliberately buried there, which is, you know, I mean, to be able to argue for burial in a in an ancient population would be a huge deal, but other people are like, no, hyenas dragged them into this cave or they got swallowed up in a cave. So there's lots of arguments about, you know, what happens and how you know what happens to creatures after they, after they pass away. The other huge problem here is determining what a species is. Delaney, what is a species? <laughs> uh, no one sat in stone what the definition is. And this isn't all the anthropologist problem. Biologists have some issues with this too. I mean, part of it has to do with what what you can what happens in in the absence. We talked about this a little bit in the last class, like what happens with creatures out there if they're naturally separated from each other, they kind of form a, spe a species because they're not in contact with each other. But sometimes if you bring them together, you find out they're all a species. In fact, what was I hearing not too long ago? Coyotes, dogs, and wolves, all perfectly members of the, the same species, but we think of them as quite different creatures most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes they get crossed together in funny ways, but so their species boundaries are often unclear. What's the classical definition of a species that you learn from? Well, what do we teach you what a species is? We usually talk about horses and donkeys and mules to illustrate. What, what are species supposed to be able to do with each other? Yeah, reproduce and have reproductive offspring. So horses and donkeys are each their own species. If they we put them together and make mules, apparently mules don't reproduce with each other, so they don't get to be their own species. It's a very big debate in my family whether mules are just sad all the time because of this. But um, anyway, the classic definition of a species are creatures that can interbreed together and have interbreeding offspring. And as I said, even in today's world, we're not always sure where those boundaries lie, but it's pretty darn difficult to do when you're talking about fossils that you can't put them together in real life and see if they can interbreed or not. And so there are some people, they, the broad definition that, uh, or I mean the, the broad groupings that Michael Gonzalez and Camp use are the classic ones of the lumpers and the splitters. And so the lumpers, every time you find a bone, they all say, ah, that's just a variation on this species. I'm sure if they got together, they could reproduce. So no reason to get excited here, no new species names. Whereas the splitters, if they find a bone or a tooth or something, they're like, aha, a new species. And in fact, let's give it a name. Let's give it my name, right? So, you know, I mean, this is in part because who wants to just find a bone and be like, oh yeah, that's just part of this species. Much better to find a bone and be like, Aha, new species, we can name it now. We can get some famous, everybody likes to name things. So, you know, I mean, some of you were perplexed as I sometimes am as well about the debates and the definitions and will they ever settle these things? 
And it is true in this field. There have been some huge and rancorous debates. I'm not sure if more than others, but quite a lot of debating about this. Um, again, part of it is the fame of being able to name things. Part of it is the limited area in which some of these things are found. There have also been some very outsized personalities in this business. Um, the Leakey family, for example, has several generations of people doing these things. So um, it's just, uh, it's been a lot of debates. Um, so we're going to try and stick to the big, the big stuff and the big lessons that we know about human evolution. And if you really want to get into the debates, you can. Ah, yes, interbreeding. How do you determine interbreeding fossils? How do you distinguish male pelvis, a male pelvis from a female pelvis? It's way too early in the morning. This is on page 85 of Muckle Gonzalez and Camp. It's probably a little too early in the morning to be staring at a pelvis so closely. But what is the huge defining feature that we can all see that females have and males don't? Yes. Tends to be wider. <laughs> Well, that is true. It tends to be wider. But as Michael Gonzalez and Camp tell us on page 85, that's a pretty subtle thing. It tends to be wider, typically wider, more basin shaped. I guess my point is there actually is no something that pops out that you're like, aha, there it is. We know that all the males have this and all the females have that. And it will depend upon whether the female has given birth or not, or how many times, how wide that angle is going to be, et cetera. Um, so there's actually a lot of indeterminacy in the classification of skeletal remains. In the old days, we just lumped them all into males. <laughs> and so there was an overclassification of males in the archaeological record. We'll read about that later on. Uh, these days, thankfully, we're slightly more careful about this, and we've uh, reclassified some of those and left a lot of them as indeterminate, because there is no single feature that you can say, and there's actually quite a wide variation, both in the male, female, and in betweenish categories. So uh, there's nothing about the human skeleton that necessarily uh, tells us exactly what we sometimes believe about what's going on down there. All right, so I wanna start out before we get into what we know now about human evolution are some of the things that we used to think, some of the old ideas, some of the things that got us into trouble uh, when we looked back at human evolution. In the old days, we were looking for big brains because Human beings, some human beings like to believe we are really the smartest creatures on earth and our intelligence is what marks us off as human beings. And so we always went searching for creatures that had larger brains. And we were also searching for what we talked about with the great chain of being missing links. So the idea that between every creature, there had to be other creatures. And this was the idea of phyletic gradualism, or that everything had to be along a nice smooth line from one creature to another, and it could only change over a very, very long period of time. Might as well put that up there. Nice, smooth, and straight lines of evolution. This is going back into the last chapter. The idea that things proceed in a very linear fashion from one creature to another. Now, this got us into trouble because since people were looking for big brain creatures and missing links, there were some clever people who put, say, a chimpanzee bone together with a human jawbone and said, aha, here I found the missing link. And it was, 
accepted for a decent amount of time and later finally proven to be a hoax. Piltdown Man was a hoax. But people were prompted to believe it because they were looking for those big brain creatures from back in the day. Of course, we only had one of the reasons these hoaxes were more, more viable is because that only the fossils were available. There was only fossil evidence and that's all you had to go on. And the idea was that Biological change came first, physical changes. And then after that, once we had big brains and physical change, we get tools and learning and what we call culture. So these were the old ideas, I would say maybe a hundred years ago uh, around of what people were looking for in human evolution. And as I said, it led to uh, some hoaxes, some dead ends, and some uh, some bad bad ideas about human evolution. So, what we think now will be uh, will be open to revision, but I think we have a a better picture of what's going on in evolution. We've talked about this before, but we are looking for not missing links, but common ancestors. So creatures that from those ancestral creatures diverge out various types. And so we know that the ancestor is probably like chimpanzees and probably like bonobos in some ways, but it's not going to be exactly the same as either one of those because those creatures have also been evolving. But we can worry, that's probably what our common ancestor is like. And that the first thing that distinguishes or the first element of divergence between the hominins and the, uh, the other, the creatures who would eventually become more like chimpanzees and bonobos is those creatures that became habitually bipedal, walking around more and more and that was their primary use uh, mobility. The brains of these creatures were still very much within the ape range. There was no noticeable cranial expansion for millions of years. This divergence is probably around six to eight million years ago. Again, it is not big brains which separate out the species. It's bipedalism here. And I guess I will say, uh, well, let's just put it up here, that we now know that there is a lot of different bipedal species. How many exactly is up for debate, but we know there is a lot of range of variation. Some people say 30 to bipedal species. Some people say, oh, now it's more like three. But all the same, there's quite a wide range of diversity from what we call hominins, that's basically bipedal apes, to the homo species, which we'll talk about in the next class, which emerge about two, two and a half million years ago. Now, the reason I'm sort of pausing here is it's oftentimes easy to project back into the past and talk about homo sapiens and us and what we were like six million years ago. And just, if you ever hear me saying that, just, just yell out and say, no, that's not us. Well, us is us. And we might go us homo sapiens back to about 300,000 years ago. But we're talking about bipedal creatures on the African, in the African uh, lands. I'm not sure if we're going to then say us. A lot of those creatures went extinct and didn't make it. So uh those are the the characteristics from before we now have uh as we're talking about we know that hybridization of species is actually a very important part of evolution so subspecies that drift off and then come back together and then rehybridize results in sometimes fairly dr dramatic genetic changes 
And so a lot of people use the, uh, well, let's just say that this is part of, of the models of punctuated equilibrium that we discussed in the last class, that not all changes are gradual. Some can be fairly rapid in evolutionary time, let's say over 100,000 years. Um, and they result in what some people call mosaic evolution, which is to say that different traits arise at different times and are combined and recombined in different creatures. So that there's not this one gradual species ascent over, over the, the time of the species. We now have a little bit more than, or a lot more hopefully than just the fossil evidence. So we get stuff from genetics, uh, the geology and environment people have become much more able to reconstruct uh, ancient environments and ancient climate patterns. So that's gotten a lot better. The genetic stuff has been kind of surprising because we thought the genetics would simply sort everything out and we'd finally figure out, okay, we know exactly what happened, uh, that it would make everything simpler. It turns out that the more we're learning about the genetics, the more and more complicated the human story looks like. And we're seeing hybridizations events and species that we used to think were distinct or turn out to have genetic evidence that they interbred more than we thought. So the genetics has actually uh, been, uh, been, a, been a surprisingly uh, rich field for revealing the complexity of uh, human behavior and our human ancestors. And finally, in contrast to the idea that biology comes first and then tools, intelligence, culture later, we now know that being able to learn how to do things, to learn how to walk, to learn how to use tools, to learn different cultural traditions are extremely ancient and interact with our developing biology. So we have been evolving together with stone tools we know for over two and a half million years, but surely there were, was tool use even before those stone tools that people were, uh, creatures were developing and using and transmitting from generation to generation. So this is part, the learning and the culture is part of the biology and part of our developing organism. So I think this helps us to, to interpret what was going on better in the existing fossil record and what we now look for in the fossils. As I mentioned, the defining feature uh, that results in these divergences between uh, what we call hominins or bipedal hominoids uh, starts at around five to 10 million years ago. And again, this is a long period of time because these things don't just happen all at once. We used to think they happened all at once. We used to imagine that all of a sudden these creatures stood up took their big heads out of the ground and strode out onto the African savanna with a spear in hand, ready to hunt some wild animals. Art, what would happen to our big headed spear person striding out onto the savanna? What's the first thing that's gonna happen to that person? Huh? Gonna get hunted gonna get knocked down, yeah, very funny idea, because in fact, these first creatures that were bipedal were about as tall as preschoolers. They weren't gonna be doing any hunting. They were gonna get, they were gonna get knocked off as soon as they stood up. We also know that uh, the grasslands were emerging in Africa. Some of the great African forests were, were dying back, but it was not as grassy and savanna-like as we once thought. What probably was more true that there was a, a, a varied terrain 
that the creatures were trying to get across and get through and navigate different environments. And we used to have this, again, this wonderful idea of the, the hunter, man the hunter striding out there, but that doesn't seem to be exactly right. So why, why do we go bipedal? Let's see, Christine, what's one, one idea for why we chose we, we chose, there I go, see, here I am, back six million years ago, choosing to go bipedal. I think I'll do it today. Uh, why? <laughs> use your hands to use tools, freeing the hands, so that I can use my PowerPoint projector more effectively. Yes, freeing the hands to use tools. I mean, I guess this is, this seems possible. But if you look at chimpanzees and bonobos, when they're not rocking around, they can just sit back and use their hands too. So I don't know. I like the carrying the babies idea. That seems to me more likely you have to carry a baby over distance. I like carrying, carrying babies. I think that's probably important. Although, again, if you look at chimpanzees, bonobos, they can put that baby on their back and walk off or the baby's clutching its tummy. So I don't know, maybe. Hard to carry a baby. Maybe that's just because I was weak. Ah, uh, oh, yes. Uh, Jess, I was going to have you talk about this one. Thermoregulation. What is that big word for? Yeah, this was an idea that came about when we were thinking about the African grasslands and that hot African sun beating down on our backs all day long. And we'd be like, aha, if you stand up, it just hits your head and you don't have your back all sunburned. Um, again, maybe, I mean, it does seem to regulate body temperature, but as I said, the, it might not have been at the grasslands that we thought. Um, we talked about being able to view prey, uh, prey over the, the grasslands, maybe spot those predators before they got to you, be able to see things. Uh, some people have thought about uh, scavenging animals. So, uh, a lot of people like to think of human early homo species as hunters, but probably what you know, on the, in the great land of African predators, what they did was take the bones and stuff and got, get the bone marrow out with some of those tools later on after other animals had had their, had their fill. Um, so some people like that idea. As I mentioned, the African uh, terrain was becoming more varied. And although walking is not a very efficient way to get around uh, just over short distances, you can do it faster if you're quadrupedal, uh, as many animals do when they're out running us. Over time, over distances, actually you can walk longer periods than you can if you're using all four limbs. So it might not be the most efficient over a short burst, but over if you have to navigate varied terrain and varied environments in one day or several days, uh, walking can be a, a more efficient way to do things. Uh, Michael Gonzalez and Camp mentioned display uh, that Certain primates make themselves seem larger and scarier if they stand up. And we see this happening. So that could be part of why these creatures went bipedal. I guess I would say that none of these has been definitively proved. And so maybe there's a combination of these. Maybe there's no one factor. I think somebody asked what what my, well, I don't know. Um, sometimes I think, what, what's my favorite one? So I, I don't know. I'm not, this is not my field. But I'll tell you one, I, there's one that I don't like. 
And there's one, a couple that I like. The one that I don't like, there are two aspects of the display one. Let's see, this is on page 92. The major advantage of bipedalism was for display, two aspects. Uh, most, many animals make themselves look larger as a show of dominance or aggression, blah, blah. Another view of the display hypothesis reasons that those who stood upright exposed their genitals more, likewise leading to more sex and more babies who carried the trait. An interesting but not likely scenario. I say not even an interesting scenario. It's not even nice to think about it. I'm sorry that I just read that in there or that they even included that in the book. This is not something that happened in human evolution. So don't use it to justify anything we do in today's world. There is no reason to do that. Um, so I don't like that one. <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the standing of making yourself look bigger. I'm a little bit partial. I think the scavenging animals is, I, I think that was a huge part of human evolution. And I'm also partial to endurance walking. Um, I think those were, were big deals back in the day, but that's, that's, my, uh, that's my take. Um, I'm not, this isn't, this isn't my field. The, part, the most important part about this is that we eventually did uh, start to go habitually by people. Now, when we think about walking, uh, Michael Gonzalez and Camp tell us that some people have estimated that there were more, as many as, or more than 30 bipedal species, and that most of them went extinct. So, so some of you were very good in this class, better than usual, about describing the advantages and the disadvantages of being bipedal. And when 30 species go extinct that are bipedal, you might wonder, well, maybe that wasn't such a great idea after all. Maybe we just got, got kind of lucky. The other thing I will say about walking is, and we talked about this maybe in the very, very first class or second class, that humans learn how to walk. It's not something that we come out doing when we're, we come out of the womb. Uh, there are creatures that are moving quite well when they come out and they wonder how they do that. Humans take time and they need the assistance of other caregivers and we're very dependent on others in order to learn how to walk and to learn how to walk in different styles. Now, certainly the anatomy has to change and it does change over time, but there's been some speculation recently that eh, maybe the anatomical changes aren't as big as we think and you can you know if you have chimpanzees in the right environment and you teach them how to walk from a young age look at that cute little chimpanzee that's from today's world just walking along so other primates uh, gibbons actually do a lot of bipedal locomotion so do bonobos so you know it might there's definitely anatomical changes but those might not be as necessary as we think all right, so let's talk about a couple of creatures that we know. <laughs> well, we don't know that much about Artie. Artie is a great, uh, a, a great find. It's the shorthand for a creature that is called Artipithecus ramidus. It was discovered back in around the year 2000, but then took a long time before it was actually announced they reconstructed the skeleton in 2009. One of the a great reconstruction of the skeleton. One of the interesting things about Artie. Oh, so if we have the first bipedal creatures emerging at six to eight million years ago, Artie is seen as kind of a, a, a creature between some of the older stuff that we have and some of the newer stuff that we have. So between uh, the the early hominoids, the bipedal hominoids, and the, and the australopiths, who we'll talk about in a second. What's interesting about, one of the interesting things about Artie is, there it is, I'm probably blocking it off, but you've got the opposable toe. So you have, um, we talked about opposable thumbs and hands, but in Artie you have the opposable toe. And so the, 
question has been is, is if already seems to be bipedal, but does it mean that they were grasping up into the trees and even supporting the so-called walking in trees hypothesis, which is that bipedalism didn't develop on the ground as much as it was for getting around in the trees? Um, hard to say. So the people who discovered Artie were very excited, obviously. This was a big find and there's a decent amount of skeletal stuff. But then some people were like, ah, it's just a creature who went off on its own and it's not even on the main line of human evolution. And so then they got mad at each other for a while. Um, it's hard to say, right? I mean, there's, again, there's the skeletal finds. We know there was, I think what we do know is there were a large variety of of creatures that were becoming bipedal and maybe becoming bipedal in different ways. Um, but whether this particular skeleton was part, exactly part of, of the line that would lead to humans is less clear. By the time we get to what are called the Australopiths, or there's some species, technical name is the Australopithecus afarensis. From about 4 million years ago to about 2 million years ago. Don't be confused by the Australo. All of this again happens in Africa, uh, but these are known as the Australopiths. The most famous of these is the skeleton of Lucy. It's just so named because on the night that it was discovered, there were playing the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And so this became a very famous skeleton and toured, toured the country. With Lucy, we have more secure skeletal evidence of bipedalism. So with already it's hard to tell with the Australopiths, and there's a lot of them, not just Lucy, you have the toes that are going in the right direction. You have the limbs that look more adapted to bipedalism. And we have a wonderful hard evidence of habitual bipedalism, which comes to us from Lytoli in Tanzania at about 3.7 million years ago, where I have a layer of volcanic ash put down and so we get this wonderful thing where we have skeletal evidence and we also have a layer of volcanic ash, which we can date because volcanoes erupt at certain times. And so we have a good dating on this. And then we have a line of bipedal footprints with the toes in the right position so that things can push off and little little creatures walking next to bigger creatures. You don't get much better than that. And so we're quite sure that at about 2 million years ago, there are a number of different, still variation, uh, diversity, whether these are part of a single species or we have multiple species going around of habitually bipedal creatures who are making their way uh, in Africa in different forms at about two and a half, three million years ago. And that is when we start to see out of the, uh, out of the Australopiths, the development of various uh, lineages that have been assigned to Homo or to our own. So we get here from, uh, in, in this class, we see that mobility, being able to migrate, move and be bipedal is at the very center at the very heart of human evolution. If anybody wants to make laws to keep people from moving around and migrating and doing all these things, humans are great at moving around. We need to be able to do that to, to survive. That's been part of our human heritage. So uh, 